<laughs> we must be live. Are we live? All right. Good evening and welcome to Classic Car Restoration Club Questions and Answers. You know, uh, Gary was supposed to be here tonight. Uh, he couldn't make it. You know, he called and said that like he wasn't feeling good. He, you know, couldn't make it at the last minute. Thankfully, you know, Ross came in. Glad to have you with us, Ross. Been I'm a glad while. Glad to be here. Been I know you've been time. in the shop lately, but you haven't been like on our yeah. Q and A's lately. So it's good to see you back yeah. here. Um, the, uh, going forward, we've got, uh, right out of the, right out of the shoot here, uh, Mark has a, Mark West has a question. He has a 1955 Mercury and he's wondering if the hood hinges would be painted, uh, when I do the paint comes off when the hinges bend. Yeah, it, uh, a lot of, and, and a lot of cars, well, in some cars they did paint the hood hinges, and it, it's a common problem. Uh, on, on the 55 Ford, I believe they were parkerized, and we've actually got a video on uh, kind of rebuilding hood hinges, which we actually go in and we talk about how to do, uh, there's, there's two kinds, there's a mag, the manganese phosphate and a zinc phosphate. And Ford, I believe, used the manganese phosphate, which is, uh, it's a coating that you can, you know, all you need is a big aluminum kettle, a gallon of manganese phosphate solution, and some distilled water, and you heat it up, and, you know, after you blast your hood, hinge, sandblast your hood hinges, just matter of dro dropping them in there, uh, usually got to condition it. If if you watch the video, you'll get like a full uh, uh, how did how it's done kind of process. But you know, on the cars that we've done, manganese manganese phosphate tends to be, and it it was also called Parkerizing. Some guys will call that like a lot of carburetor bases and stuff like that were done with the Parkerizing. Um, so if you if you do it with the manganese phosphate, that'll give you a real dark gray, almost a black. And it's just a matter of, you know, you drop it in, let it boil, or let it, you know, it's, it's at like 185 degrees for, you know, it's about 20 minutes. It sits in there, I think, if I, if I recall correctly. And then you pull it out, and then you just uh, you quick dry it off, and then hose it down with, like, some WD-40. And it, what the manganese does, it creates a real porous so surface, that's real acceptable to oil. Yep. So the oil gets in there and you'll have no issues with, uh, you know, corrosion or paint chipping or anything else. Check out that video. I think, uh, I think in that video, we actually use the zinc phosphate, which is a little lighter gray. Some cars use that. Uh, some cars use the manganese phosphate. They're both, you can get them at most like uh, gun manu or gun, hobby shops, places that, uh, you know, deal to work with gunsmiths and stuff like that. It's available online too. Uh, so you should be able to find it. Works really good. It, it holds up. You know, that's what I like about it over even, you know, like I, I use it even on a few cars where they did actually paint them originally. Just because all the mechanisms and everything going on, the paint always chips off. And they always flex. end up looking like crap after Once a while. metal flexes, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it, there's just no way to really keep no. that stuff on there very good. So, you know, check out that video. You know, I think, I believe the 55s used the manganese phosphate for their hood hinges. Uh, I'd have to do like a little more research, know for sure, but uh, I know a lot of, you'll see a lot of cars at car shows where they just paint them, but that's just because it's easier, you know, but actually it, you know, what you want to do is do it once, and not have to do yes. it again and again. Thanks, Mark, for the question. If anybody else has any questions, let me know. Uh, down below here, uh, there's a there's a little thing for uh, 66 tips. You know, this is a thing that we kind of threw together with a bunch of tips from fellow members. Uh, put a bunch of effort into that, so uh, it's free. You know, just go ahead and download that. I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, I think, they, you know, with 66 of them in there, I know there's like one or two you're going to find that's a real gem. Makes your life a little easier in the shop. And, 
And anytime you learn something to uh, make your life easier in the shop, everything seems to go a little bit better. The uh, moving ahead, guys. Uh, our first, we've got we've got some questions here that were uh, emailed in. I've also got some questions here uh, that came ahead of time. Also, if you have any questions, now is the time to like type them out. You know, any subject whatsoever in the car restoration, we're ready to tackle it. Um, the uh, now, if I can navigate my way over, you see, I get enough stuff going on on the screen. I can't find nothing. Then uh, we have a question from. We'll send this one over to Ross. The uh, uh, Ross, he, uh, we have a member who says I want to replace the condenser and the compressor on my classic car AC system. It is currently charged. Should I should I go to a shop and have the A system discharged before I remove all the hoses and replace these parts? It's a 1967 Chevy Camaro RS. Well yes, you can't discharge it for one thing yes. legally. There. Yeah, you can't. It's it's technically it's against the law. Yes. If if your system is pressurized R12 with R12, you can't just open up the hoses and let it exactly. uh, go out into the atmosphere. It's just it's not a smart thing to do, anyways. And and yeah, you know, yeah, just spend you know spend. Most shops will uh, evacuate your system for. A pretty nominal charge. Yeah, and then and, uh, they can actually recover it also. And exactly. Sometimes. And, you know, it's if you go to recharge it, and, you know, if, you know, and if, because it's a 67 Chevy Camaro, maybe you want to think about upgrading, upgrading the, converting the system over to R134A. Uh, it's cheaper, more available. You can get it at any auto parts store. It's not going to break the bank, you know. You do need to drain the oil out of your compressor and replace yep. that. And yep. it's a good idea to, uh, and you have to put different ports on the lines to actually accept the 134A mm -hmm. lines. And then it's best to use like a, what they call a barrier hose because the molecules in 134A are actually smaller than R12. It can actually go through the hose itself. But, you know, most places like, uh, vintage air and, uh, uh, and and be cool and a number of the aftermarket uh, uh, air conditioning supply companies will have new hoses for your setup for especially for a Camaro right. first gen right. Camaro. Yeah. Um, so you could replace the hoses, get you know drain the compressor, get new fill fittings. Everything should be available from. From one of the the big uh, uh, air conditioning supply companies, the uh, and that's you know it's a it's a it's a move that a lot of people make you know it just it just makes sense yeah. you know if you have to pay, if you look at what uh, they charge for the R twelve for the R twelve you know it's like five hundred bucks. And it's harder and harder to find. It is, yeah. yeah. And it's like, well, why, why not upgrade? Yeah. Okay, we have a question coming in. Adam on Facebook asks, "What rear end can I use for a 1963 Impala so I can use uh, 14 by seven uh, reverse rims?" Um, if it well, if it's a drum brake, yeah, most of them will fit a 14-inch okay. rim. Uh, in a rears, rear the rear brakes are only 30 percent of your braking, so right. it's, it the need for for disc, disc brakes in the back is is kind of overrated. You know, I've had even brake companies people tell me off the record kind of thing that you know it's just kind of an aesthetic thing as much as anything else it's only it's it's not a big portion of your braking 70 percent of your braking is your front brake so or if you're going to drag racing you if you're going to drag yeah you, know, you know if you're going to do serious performance driving most guys aren't going to do that but if you are you know if you're going to do serious performance driving road course racing right. and stuff like that yeah it, there's a real benefit to having uh this brake what rear end will work um Assume, uh, well, if it's an Impala, it's a whole 
it's in its own an impala is different from yep it's uh well it uh as gm goes it's it's uh wider for one yep. thing it's uh you know I, if it if you're gonna make your own brackets for it you're gonna weld on new brackets for it you can any axle at the right width right um uh, if you're going to look for one that's going to swap in i don't know if the other gm cars of that era the full-size full size. cars of that era will just direct swap i know old mobile had its own unique rear ends and i would yeah. imagine some of the others might as well um so i hesitate to say right off the bat that you know all the gm full sizes in 63 will swap but of course, you know, things like 64 will probably swap right 63, over. 63, like 64, that. it's uh, the um, third member type rear end. Yeah. With the pumpkin. So, so uh, as far as using it with the rims, you know, again, with most drum rear axles will work. are going to work. Yeah. So, uh, oh, he adds that he would like to use skirts. So, so he wants to put fender skirts. You just want to make sure you get your rear axle. Yeah, it... Uh, uh the word chrome reverse usually means that the the rim is actually set back further you got more front spacing on it uh you know if you want you know if you really want if you, well, of course you can cover up most of your wheel by the time you put skirts on anyways but it's not my car uh i i i would tend to think you know, usually there's a ton of space on those 63s usually. you know my first car was a 63 chevy and i think yours was 64. so we've got a little bit of experience with the yeah. uh, the old impalas but uh, there's a ton of room anyways in those wheel wells because so i i think with even with a 14 by 7 chrome reverse you should be able to clear it I oh, don't yeah. know this for oh, a yeah. I would think. But I would think 14 by 7 is not a big a rim. Factory even, wheel, really. even chrome reverse or a reverse wheel on it, still not going to put it out that far. Let's measure your backspacing on your original ones. I have, you could maybe go a little further. Yeah, that would less be. backspace. That would be a good way to go is just, uh, you know, just measure from the rim to the back of the wheel and the wheels you want to put on and see what. The difference is, and that'll tell you how far that's going to push that wheel out, tire wheel back yeah. out in terms of your wheel well. I, I I I find it hard to believe that a fourteen by seven wouldn't easily fit in there. Oh yeah, I mean I had fourteen or fifteen by eight rallies on my yeah. my sixty. You didn't have so. you didn't have fender skirts. Right, <laughs> but they didn't stick out beyond the fender. No, know, they didn't. You yeah, can't. They, everything you can't. Stayed in there. They were big, so, big yeah. darn wheel wells on those. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, I like the '57 we did. We recently did. I had a few people tell me don't put skirts on it. And it's like I think it looks so. It, depending on the style of the car you are, you know, I'm not anti skirts. I think they look good on some cars. Yeah. Uh, we have a guest who has a question. He wants to know, I have a 1967 Valiant 170 Slant 6. It makes an intermittent sound like a child's bike bell ringing. Huh. Appears to come from the rear valve train. It disappears at speed. Only hear it at idle or slow crawl. So it's a low, well, it might be occurring at higher speeds, you just don't hear it. But he only hears it at idle or a slow crawl. It kind of makes a Bounce. ringing noise. Hmm. It, it, my first question would be, is there a rhythm to it? Or is it just yeah. arbitrarily, randomly makes the noise? Or is if it has a rhythm to it, then... Then it, yeah, it could be anything. It could be okay. could be even like something hitting the flywheel or the yeah, you know if it's yeah. if it's any kind of rhythmic thing, then it could be an interference issue somewhere on the rotating assembly, and it could be anywhere. From, yeah, it could be anything from like a a harmonic balancer falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> An occasion we had recently that made sort of a weird <laughs> ringing noise uh, to a uh, 
you know, a host of things. It could, yeah. it could be. You got you, You're going to have to try to narrow it down. And like I said, if it's rhythm, you know, even the well, even the harmonic wasn't like it wasn't regular. It was just like every song you hear, and then it would stop, and it was like the outer ring would kind of like rub. come back and rub on the flywheel or on the timing cover, and then and then it would hit, and then it would pop back on, and it would make no sound for a while. So it was yeah. like totally random. So, you know, it, it'd be try to, try to, you know, run the car, you know, get some friends over, and, you know, have everybody take a listen, see if you can narrow it down. Another you know, question and, is, is it a manual? Sometimes you can get a noise from your... Throw up bearing. Throw up bearing. That's yeah. true. Yeah, on a on a manual a manual shift. Yeah, you can get uh, throw out bearing noise. Uh, appears to come from the rear valve train. It disappears at the rear valve train. I can't think of anything in the uh, well. Make that kind of noise. The slant six is not enough animal, but it, uh, it shouldn't be making anything. I can't imagine what could be there. Uh, Hector writes, he's restoring a 1962 Catalina engine has been rebuilt, Catalina, the engine has been rebuilt and sitting in the car, wants to go with an EFI, but not sure if I should use a carburetor to break in the engine so that I don't run into any issues with the EFI during break-in period. Uh, your thoughts? I I think you'd be fine running EFI. Yeah. Actually, the EFI will probably be as far as the carburetor. You know, as far as the, most people don't know where the engine's at if they're running a carburetor. Uh, if you have right. an EFI on there, you, it can it's tell you. You can t it it yeah. It's going to want to optimize the mixture to get your best air fuel ratio. I so think. you may you know as far as Wait, doing it with a carburetor first. I'd go EFI straight out. Uh, you're you're probably safer than if you put a carburetor on. It. Yeah, especially there's, if it's not high performance or anything. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of you know, it'd be from our own tests, you know, where we put brand new carburetor and intakes on engines before that they claim would be perfect. And there's one manufacturer that used to build some, you know, pretty looking stuff, but it was, you know, it didn't always perform the way it should. Uh, but uh, there was a lot of cases even with that where, you know, a nice pretty looking intake doesn't necessarily give you eight cylinders of even combustion. So, uh, Carburetors can lead to all kinds of problems. It's uh, I wouldn't be afraid to just drop on an EFI. No. On my '56 Chevy Antonio, right? Uh, on a '56 Chevy, he can uh, hook the power supply wire on my tachometer to the 12 volt side of the ballast resistor, since it was the original wire. And fuse box, which is limited terminal connections. Can, so he wants to know on his 56 Chevy, can he hook the power supply wire for his tachometer to the 12 volt side? So that would be the, the main, the keyed hot side keyed hot. Uh, of the ballast resistor since it was the original wire and fuse block which is limited terminal connection. Um, I, you know, uh, I know some guys that will say, oh, no, you can't do, you can't run anything off the, the hot side of the ballast resistor. I always, you know, to me, it's a keyed hot. And yeah. as long as, you know, the, as long as you're not running, you know, your heater fan or something that's really going to draw big off of it, you know, you should be fine or under the tank. Some vehicles, though, were did have a resistor wire, but I don't know if they started them that early. Yeah, well, yeah, and um, so you weren't getting your full. Yeah, holes. if it well, and then I, I'd have to look to see, but I, I believe I believe that a '56 Chevy uses a ballast resistor, although I'm not sure if they use a resistor wire instead. Um, but 
uh, that I, I you know don't recall right off the top of my head, but I do know if you're. Just, I would think that you could just connect it to the twelve volt side of it. You can always check it, put a put a voltmeter gauge on it, and see if you're getting the full twelve volts to it. Um, but as, as a power source, I think it would work. There's, you know, you, uh, granted, there's probably other keyed hot sources, too, that you could pull it out. I know there's usually off the solenoid, there's usually a hot circuit on there, one, uh, the starter solenoid. Um, and some of that, you know, there's always uh, other avenues to do it. But, you know, uh, I know for me, I, a lot of times I even wire, like, the electric choke into the, the hot side of the ballast resistor just because I know it's just a keyed hot coming from the switch and it's not going to draw a lot there in right. so yeah I'm sure I'll, you know I'm sure I'll, I'll get those people that'll say oh Yo, you can't do that but that's what they tell me all the time if you had a high performance coil or something yeah. maybe yeah well like anything yeah if you're if you're doing something outside of the box that's really you know draw pulling a lot of amps you might not right. want to use that uh, Ricky on Facebook says, I have a a 15 by 8 on the rear of his 64 with skirts, and I like it. Yeah. Thanks, Ricky, for your uh, chiming in. Yeah, it, uh, uh, I it think always you, looks I think you said it. you had 15 by 8 some yeah. years. So the only and, thing I didn't have and, was skirts, but yeah, it looks a lot nicer with a tire that's got a little more yeah. Yeah. width to it. Mm -hmm. I know I had, uh, well, actually, I think I had, like, uh, L60s on the back of my 63 Chevy. Not that, you know, it was, uh, you know, a real high-performance beast. But, you know, it was uh, a lot of fun. And uh, back in those days, we were into stuffing as much tire as we could in that wheel well. Even with skirts, it looked better. Yeah. Be tire there. Yeah. Everything looked Why better. Opinion? Everything looked better with bigger <laughs> tires. <laughs> okay on the uh, slant six he says it has no rhythm so it just random uh it randomly makes this noise wow mm. and it is an automatic it is an automatic yeah it it it's still i'm i'm twerking still scratching my head maybe it'll come to me yet but uh you know, if it's just a random noise that came out um, and that sounds like a bell, that, you know, usually a bell sound tends to be, I don't know, uh, things like flywheels or flex plates, you know, if the flex plates is cracked, you know, kind of, yeah, there's always a potential of that. Because uh, the flex plate, when it hits stuff, it tends to ring, you know, and... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it'd be in toward the back, back. He says back of the valve train. I can't think of anything in the valve train back there that would make that noise. Maybe I got like some slant six guys out there that have some little bit more in feed input here. But you know, I mean, I'd I'd start looking for something that's rubbing. You know. Yeah. Uh, Bill asks, how do you start rewiring using a kit? <laughs> this job is overwhelming to me. Uh, I've done a few, I've done more than a few cars where I've done a complete, you know, uh, wire, rewire front to back. Uh, used, I used almost exclusively for a lot of years just the Ron Francis kits. Uh, there are also a host of other kits out there nowadays. When I was yeah. doing a ton of that rewiring stuff, uh, there was only a few manufacturers, but now there's, you know, Dozens of no manufacturers, yeah. you know, <clears throat> auto wire and and painless, and of course Ron France is still. And there's, um, uh, you know, like I say, there's just a, a whole bunch of them out there. It's just a matter of finding, you know, a kit that you like. And how do you start? You know, it it's it's probably like the one thing we haven't done a video on because it's so time consuming. Mm -hmm. Because it all involves running one wire at a time. You it's know? all color coded, but and, you still have to go through every instruction. Yeah. For and what I liked about the like the Ron Francis kits and stuff like that is like every wire said on it what it was. Okay. It'll say right turn signal, 
and then you go, all right, this needs to go, you know, over here and over there. And, you know, the big thing is, is to keep it organized, keep it neat and run your wires clean and keep them away from moving things or hot things or chemical things or, or anywhere where they could get damaged. And then when you're, and think about, you know, how you're going to wire loom everything together. When you're in the engine compartment, you know, most of your wiring should be in a loom or it should get taped. Um, we've got some videos on that on the site, uh, you know, we're using cold shrink tape. Uh, I know, uh, Bob Wilson down at, uh, RJ restorations. He's a big one on, you know, because he does mainly Mustangs, everything gets taped, use the cold shrink tape, not the electrical tape, uh, in a pinch for a short circuit. Yeah, you can use some electrical tape. It'll get the job done. Uh, but, uh, you know, basically, yeah, it seems overwhelming, but you just start doing it one wire, you know, uh, one wire at a time, you know, it's like a week before we were all to go to a big car show or had a big car show, Ross tears the entire electrical system <laughs> out of his car. And, uh, <laughs> luckily it was a factory replacement. <laughs> so it wasn't that bad. And yeah, you looked at it and go, you did what? Yeah. But you know, it. It like anything, you just start running, making circuits, running them one at a time, and before you know it, you're done. Yep. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to say there's a you know silver bullet to make it easier, but it just it if you bring it down to its core, it's like one wire at a time. You're gonna run one wire to the back tail light. You're gonna run, you know, another wire back there for the turn signal. You're gonna run, you know. Yeah. So and pretty much your wiring harness is for replacement style or you know, mark for what, whether, yeah, you know. whether it be a replacement harness yeah. where you just have to drop and plug and play or right. even a full custom harness. Right. It's all, uh, marked. it's all one wire at a time. Yeah. So. And it's, it's, uh, don't be afraid of it. Just start in, you know, you start, know. start wiring one circuit. When that circuit done, move to the next one. Uh, my guess, how do you decide which power steering line is the return line on a original 56 Bel Air swapping over to a newer style power steering pump. The return line is usually lower pressure. Um, yeah, it's not usually a high pressure hose where no, connections are. No, they're usually the, they're the, the power side of it will have, you know, the flare fittings on both ends. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the return line will only have you know, like maybe one on the steering gear and have like just a, just a hose clamp on the return line. on the return because it's just going up to the reservoir at that point. Um, so first look at the lines, like 90% of the time, the lower pressure line is just held on with a hose clamp. It's not a flare fitting. Um, you know, there are a few cases where it's all flare fittings both ways. Usually the return line is a bigger line uh, because the smaller line gets maximum pressure and they want it. It's low pressure coming out. So you just, you're just moving tons of fluid on the way back. So usually the smaller lines are high pressure lines and the bigger lines are low pressure lines. Also the low pressure lines most often don't have like a flare fitting on the pump. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see, return line on the original 56 swapping over to a newer style power steering pump. I imagine you're going to run a Saginaw pump like uh, most small block Chevys do or whatever. That'd be, that'd be a good choice, you know, the uh, more compact and have you ever used Gunson col uh, color tune to adjust your carb idle mixing settings. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I have not. Um, maybe if you even you might have a new one on me here. You know, yeah. uh, maybe I, maybe I got to get out more, Bruce. Uh, Gunson color tune to adjust your carb idle mixture setting. Huh. You have me. You have me Not curious. You that. have me curious. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, I'll definitely write this down just so I, I know what it is. 
but uh, may maybe Bruce, you can, you know, maybe you want to pipe in and uh, give us a little feedback on exactly what does uh, Gunston Color Tune do? Um, carb tuning. I always like it when somebody brings me something like it makes me go, what? <laughs> That's a new one. <laughs> that's a new one. I mean, I got to get out more. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good one. Must be some younger thing. I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> no younger, newer. Uh, I don't want to sit and do my research here, but yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm intrigued to know. Uh, yeah, Bruce, if you if you can give me a little more information, you know, we'll share it with everybody else here. The uh, the. Moving over to, we've got like another question here. Bring this one up. Okay, I just purchased a 1937 Ford replica body and chassis by Wild Rod. Uh, uh, it doesn't have engine hood latch, and I'm a little nervous about driving it without one. Does anyone know where I can get a hood latch that will work with this car? Um, yeah, the Wild Rods were made for a few years. There, it's a company in Ontario uh, or in Canada that was uh, producing these, I, to the best of my knowledge, they're no longer in business. Um, the, uh, the hinges, you know, the, the hood hinges, I've seen them work a few different ways because the hood is designed to open sideways. Yeah, there's, there's some people that don't put like a latch on them. They just kind of kind of figure the wind will keep it down. I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, if you do just a little bit of research, you'll see that uh, there's a host of aftermarket street rod hood uh, latches out there that can be uh, adapted to actually work with, you know, but again, now here we have another issue where, you know, the car is all done and it's in paint and everything else. It's not usually the kind of time you start uh, wanting to modifying yeah. stuff to make, uh, make the latches work. Um, there, you know, they, I know that the car does have a prop rod on the hood. So sometimes there's a case where you can run the prop rod that, that holds it up normally. You can run it down to like a regular like hood release kind of mechanism down low inside the engine compartment so that prop rod can latch into that. And that can serve as your hood release, not, you know, it's not like the big latch in the front where you don't really need one because it's opening to the side. You just want to secure that side so it doesn't open up. So think about things like, like your prop rod uh, where you can just work it into a latch. Uh, and if you look, there's a, a number of the, uh, like especially the foreign cars and stuff like that, they have a, a small lightweight latches that will, can easily be hooked to the, like the frame rail down below. And because it's all down and low and everything, a lot of times you can get that to work. Uh, but just check that out and, uh, you know, those, those are great looking cars. They're unique. Whenever they show up at the car shows, you know, everybody goes, ooh, what's that? Just because they are so one-off. Uh, but, you know, uh, unfortunately, yeah, companies like that that, that, uh, that do go out of business uh, sometimes leaves uh, uh people wondering, you know, where to get parts and stuff like that. And hopefully, hopefully you don't run into a case where you need to replace a hood panel or a fender or something like that, because then now, now without parts available, you're into full custom work. So good luck. I, I don't wish you any harm, uh, but it should be, uh, uh, 
kind of a, a good deal. Uh, okay, we got a guest who's, who's uh, if, if you're interested in the, gul gul uh, in the guns and color tune stuff, and I'll check this out later. I can't do it on a run here. Otherwise, I'll bore you if I'm just sitting here while <laughs> Googling. But uh, feel free to click on the link that they've provided and, uh, you know, learn a little bit more about the, the guns and color tune. Um, I know I'm anxious to look into it after we get off the air. Um, let's see, Martin writes, I have a Holly carburetor on my 66 427 390 horse Corvette. With the lousy gas we have here in California, would you recommend installing an EFI system? Thank you. You're a big block kind of guy, big block Chevy guy. It just depends. Yeah. I mean, what, what's lousy gas? I mean, well, yeah. on a leaded premium, <laughs> ninety-one octane. You yeah. Know. Well, you know, they. I know. I. I. We can't speak to what they do in California. Right. Um, but I would think that you could. Um, I'm not sure how much like uh, That's alcohol a tough thing. they're putting in the gas out there. Yeah. I mean, if it's a four twenty-seven and it's it's definitely high compression, so you have to run some kind of high octane in that thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm not, um, would you rent, recommend installing, you know, I think everything runs better on EFI. I definitely would. Uh, with, you know, without, without question, you're always getting, you know, it's always adapting the mixture to whatever, you know, to. I that think it'd be a good idea. Yeah, I think if if you're after if if you're out to keep it bone stock, no, keep the original carburetor on it and deal with the weird gas and maybe you know find some sources for better gas. Yeah. But if uh, if you're out to put a lot of miles on it and and really enjoy your car, I think the EFI is a good way to go. We'll definitely make it the mixture perfect. Yeah, the. Uh, Lanny writes, he has a 1971 Plymouth B-Body, and I have the interior all out, only to find surface rust on all the metal interior roof, floor, interior quarter panels. What is the best way to deal with the surface rust prior to installing interior panels, um, headliners, and carpet? Do I have to sand it all the way down to bare metal and prime, or can I use some kind of rust inhibitor or and trust that the metal won't uh, continue to deteriorate? Uh, we've had you know good success with products like Pour 15. Uh, you know, uh, Christian, you know, if it's going to be under the carpet and on the engine, it does a good job of stopping in the, uh, stopping the rust that's there. And also sealing it off so it's not going to get more water, more more damage like that. Especially, you know, especially cars, especially in the, you know, 60s and 70s and right. 80s. You pull down the headliner, 90% of the time it's going to be Surface solid rust, rust yeah. under there. And even inside the door panel sometimes and inside the court, it's, it, they, you know, it costs money to spray paint up there. Um. Uh, if you got the car all the way down and and we're uh, going to restore the whole car, you're going to repaint the whole car and everything else. Yeah, maybe you want to you know spray you know have it media blasted inside, but you don't need to. Product like Pour 15, you can just you know it'll you know, you can put it on with a brush. Nobody's going to see it when you're done. It's about encapsulating the rust that's there, preventing it from progressing. Uh, and, you know, products like that, you know, products like Pour Feet 15 are designed to work on rust. I know some guys that will, like, you know, clean all the rust off and then put Pour 15 on it. It's like, no, that's not the way the product is designed to work. It's designed to actually chemically alter the iron oxide and make it into a coating that doesn't have any problems like that. So, and it adheres it, very well. Yeah, and, oh, man, trying to get it off? Holy smokes, we've... You know, we've had a, we had a uh, 31 uh, Ford door in here the other day, and, and the owner had 
completely covered the inside of the door with 415, which is a good thing. It stopped the rust and prevented it from getting worse. But we needed to do like patch panel on the bottom of it because, you know, before, because it, it had, had, it had was getting weak before he even did all that. So, but rather than fix it, when he first restored the car, he just pour 15 to everything and figured, well, that'll hold it. Well, yeah, if, if the metal's bad, it needs to be fixed. And, you know, seldom does a product like pour 15 become an alternative to replacing metal. And in this case, it was even a little lacy, but he put the pour 15 on good and thick and then slapped some Bondo over the top. Well, that's not really a fix. That's, you know, you're kind of, you're, you're kidding yourself at that point. Band -aiding it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when it came time to actually get all that pour 15 out so we could TIG weld across, because TIG, TIG wants to, you know, kind of melt all of the, uh, the anything that's on the metal that wants to bring it into the weld and it contaminates yeah. the weld. So, boy, what a job getting the, the pour 15 off there. It was just, you know, you were hitting them with the grinder and it, or the two inch uh, discs and just kind of working the edge. And it's like, man, it was, it takes a chunk. If it's yeah. put on right, it takes a little bit of work to get that stuff off. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, you know, it, it's, a it's, it's a, it's a good product. We've used it quite a bit. Especially when we know that, you know, if we're tearing something apart and, you know, we get in and, you know, we, there's some little bit of surface rust inside, you know, we'll put a little 415 in there before we seal it all up again. Knowing that, that'll stabilize it and prevent the problem from Especially getting worse. Especially interior surface rust. Especially interior, yeah. interior surface rust stuff is always a big problem. Right. And, uh, you know, it's like... Uh, Car manufacturers are notorious for that. Things like, especially using as little paint as they if as they can. Right. Any car with a vinyl top almost got no paint under that vinyl right. top, you know. And it's like so notorious. You rip out the vinyl top, now you have a whole roof covered with rust. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, if nobody else has a question, I'm trying to locate a turning signal canceller spring for 55 Monterey. I've looked everywhere online and thought. Um, my, my first thought uh, is, my first thought would be, is it different than a 55 yeah. Ford? Right. Uh, and I'm, you've probably thought of this, and I don't know this on, on this. Uh, usually the, the 55 Mercury's and the 55 Monterey's share Similar. everything yeah. damn near, other than the trim and, you know, some of the trim and some of the panels, would, you know, bumpers and stuff would take on a different look, but a lot of the, the guts of it. So my first thought would be, and I'm not, and forgive me, Mark, if, I, if I'm not 100% knowledgeable on my 55 Mercury. But my first my first guess would be go look at 55 Ford because they make everything for them. Yeah. And, and see if you can locate one there. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, and, okay... You said, uh, Mark, you said it's likely the same as the 55 Ford, uh, and I believe it probably is identical to the 55 Ford. Um, and I don't know if, yeah, um, hopefully, because they make everything for a 55 Ford, they make one. If they don't, uh, geez, it, um, it's yeah. hard for me to believe that that part is that hard to find, but uh, yeah. there's no, always run into stuff like that. Maybe you know? my home. Turn single mechanism. Yeah, you might. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. You no, know, you did. He did try Ford, huh? Hmm. Hmm. He did try Ford. You can't find one, huh? Wow, that's a weird one. Uh, well, Mark, I will. I'm going to take a note, 
and I'll post it in comments. I'll, I'll do some asking around. We've got some, some uh, uh, good friends that are, you know, heavy into the mercury stuff. Return. Um, do I turn signal? Turn, turn, turn spring. Turn signal. Return spring. Return spring. Okay. Yes, I will. Uh, you know, uh, I'll ask. I'll ask a couple of my buddies that are really big into the mercury stuff, and we'll post it in the comments here uh, in the next day. Um, the uh, let's see. Um, Oh, 415. Oh, uh, it's not. It's not 415. I'm sorry. Uh, it's probably my Minnesota accent getting yeah. in the way. It's poor 15. P O R one five. Yeah. And uh, they make they make a number of different products. They make, uh, but they make some some rusting uh, conversion. And actually, I think I have a can of it in the fridge back here, or maybe I do. Yeah. And I believe they actually have. Yeah. Aerosol spray, aerosol. They, yeah, do they? Okay. Um, they kind of keep it in the fridge. You know, yeah, it's, it's weird, right? Uh, but it lasts longer. After you open the can, it just seems to last longer if you keep it cool. And uh, But it's just a... Um, uh, it's a... You know, it's a, a, a product that works really good at converting rust yeah. to a non-corrosive state. And I'm not sure if they've changed the name since, since they this? called it 415. Maybe. Gosh, that was really... I yeah, believe it. Buy this, and then it's like, oh, you can't get that. No, I, I don't know. I uh, know there was a replacement, a similar to this also. Okay. So. But, yeah, that's a kind of... Uh, Go out, uh, like I say, this is stuff that we've used in this shop. We've got gallons of this, or quarts and quarts of this stuff around. Um, uh, works really good. You know, we not only use it on the cars, but things like if you've got like a, a trailer, car trailer or something like that, uh, uh, it works really good. You can go out and you get the tongue and all that because the you know, your trailer just get beat to snot with all the rocks coming up and hitting them. And they're always rusty on the front. You put this stuff on there and it like it becomes like it coats a... It. It, yeah, it, it's, it's like your stuff, stuff is hard yeah. to come off yeah. and it and it's just it stops the rust cold. So yeah. it's, a, it's a good product. I've used it on my dock. It goes did? in the water. And it works know. great. Work good. Keeps works it from great. rusting. <laughs> <Working. laughs> there you go. Ross Dock approved. <laughs> He's got his lake cabin has That's a right. uh, 415, 415 on the dock, and it's uh, coated dock. Stop the rust coal. And you can actually paint it. Wow. Over the top of it. Yeah. So if you wanted it like a different Silver, color on you your know, dock or yeah. on your uh, trick car Make trailer, it look like aluminum. So, yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, I have used the uh, the Eastwood rust and cap plater before. I actually have used that even on some of our cars here. And the internal frame coating we've used. We've got some videos actually where we've used some of that product. Works good. That works well as uh, great as well. I, I you know I, I really love their internal frame coating stuff for like getting inside rocker panels. You know, it's like here you've talked about you know trying to stop rust before it gets worse. Right. You get that internal frame coating. It has that thin little hose, and you can feed that into your drip holes. You know, first I, I run just like hoses in there with the uh, air spray and just blow as much of the dirt and Dust stuff out dirt. of the yeah. rocker band. Because it's a closed area. You can't get in there to work on it. But you blow all that stuff out, get as much dirt and stuff out of there as possible, go in there with the... Uh, the frame coating and the uh, internal frame coating. You do your rocker panels with that, and it see it, uh, it seals, seals it up. It converts the rust, and it'll stop. You know, it'll you won't have to worry about hey, are my rockers suddenly going to give way? Hey, my car's you know gone fifty years without having any rocker right. rust, and now is a good time to address that before it does show up. 
so it's a good thing, a good product. Uh, I have nothing bad to say about the Eastwood stuff. It, you know, they're 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 scratching an itch in the market that they they really need. Um, okay, Mark says I can send you a pic. Yeah, there's um, there. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know what our email address is to send me stuff. I get people sending me stuff all the time. It usually comes into let's see if. Uh, well, I have sort of a generic one you could also send it to, uh, but through the customer support uh, line. Mark of what the spring looks like, and we'll see if we can locate that for you. The uh, uh, I also have a, a <laughs> we also have a generic one that is just classic car restoration club at gmail dot com. You want to send there. Uh, we can send that. Um, let's see. I can send it. Uh, what is the resin products used on fiberglass that seals and covers small hairline cracks and dries hard as concrete? Um, the resin product used on fiberglass that uh, is that like a gel coat? That's what I'm wondering. It's, uh, it's a resin product used on fiberglass that seals and covers small hairline cracks and dries. Uh, I don't know if a gel coat would necessarily cover a crack. A crack is I'm a crack. Maybe it's the hardener that comes with yeah. the fiberglass. Uh, and dries as hard as concrete. The gel coat is usually the last finish on most fiberglass things. If you look at a boat or anything yeah. else, the very top the coat, coat of it is always what they call gel coat. Mm -hmm. And that's a really hard finish, but it gives it a nice shine and everything else it gives it, it level. It's a, it has a self leveling characteristic and everything. It usually that's, you know, um, but for most hobbyists, they aren't going to be using gel coat a lot of, for like Corvette stuff and doing repairs on that. A lot of times we treat the fiberglass the same as, as soon as we get it smoothed out and, you know, uh, the way we like, we start to treat it like steel. Yeah. We put on, you know, you can actually put some body fillers on there. Not you don't want to go too thick. You can use some, you know, the regular kind of stuff, and then, and then, you know, use you know epoxy primers and and sand it and block it and treat it just like paint, like a, like steel when you're going to paint it. Right. Uh, but as far as, as the resin product used on fiberglass, is, I'm thinking it's gel coat. Uh, I don't do a lot of finished fiberglass work, but I'm thinking that's the product you're thinking of. Um, Bill suggests for Mark, uh, try Max Ford parts for the turn signal spring, uh, part number, blah, blah, blah. It might be it. Hey, thanks. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's a good good advice, Bill. Uh, there you go, Mark. You know, check that out. Go to you know. I know I've used Max quite a bit for some parts. They're they're uh, you know. I've heard good things. I've heard people occasionally having trouble with stuff, but you know, with any suppliers, sometimes you just you know the the part and everything. Sometimes people have trouble. Not exact, but it I. I've never had any problems with Max. I've always gotten just the parts I needed. Uh, and uh, yeah, they have a complete line. So yeah, check them out. Uh, they're one of the bigger Ford part suppliers out there. Uh, guest. I'm gonna be reinstalling my headliner on my 68 Camaro. Previous owner used a whole bunch of glue everywhere which I had to scrape off and clean all the rust around it, which I think uh, was caused by the, the glucose. Well, it could be. Uh, any tips on getting it installed easy? And can I do without glue? Um, no, I haven't done a, a, a first-gen Camaro in a while. The, uh, and I'm thinking, well, the headliner, I thought it was a suspended headliner. Same, yeah. And 
Well, a chipper may be on the edges or right, in right. the front and back. And uh, uh, is there an alternative to glue? In 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 some places, it's glue. Uh, I know that for a fact. But you know what we use is uh, uh, DAP makes a Landau top and. Is it convertible and land out top or convertible land out top trim yeah. adhesive? Yeah. Uh, that's the, we use that because we can spray it and we can brush it. Uh, it works good once you, you know, when you, you coat both, uh, you know, we put a thin coat on the headliner, put a thin coat on the steel, you let it tack up. Uh, and when you stick them together, you make sure you have it in the right Where place. You want it. Uh, otherwise, you may not get it apart again. Uh, it's uh, uh, oh, it, it's not the right spring. Keep looking, guys. Keep looking. We're going to help Mark out here tonight. <laughs> the uh, let's see. I had to escape a fall. Yeah. Uh, I have seen some things. You know, some things used in cars cause rust. Believe it or not, you know, I've even seen in some of the Mopars where they had like little foam blocks and stuff where, you know, you start looking at every car you see like that and there's rust around this foam block. And the first thought is, well, the foam block must have absorbed, absorbed moisture. moisture. And I thought that for a long time until one time I, I sat and I scraped out one of these foam block things with a screwdriver and then I just set the screwdriver on the, on the counter and I came back a couple days later, and I looked at my screwdriver. My screwdriver was rusty. From the adhesive? And, and, and the actual, I don't know, the chemical makeup of the foam contained something that was actually mm. corrosive. And I didn't know if it's something that's happened over time or if it was just, you know, it just outgassed over time. I know, like, the record, the, the old Mopar record players were notorious for rust inside of them because they had all kinds of these foam blocks in there that would just outgas nasty stuff that would just rust everything in there. It turned acidic maybe. Yeah, it, yeah, I'm not sure if it was the glue or if the foam itself or, you know, I, I, I can't answer that. But, yeah, it's the, it's the kind of thing where the glue could cause it, you know, depending on what glue they used. And, you know, it's like in a, uh, a 68 Camaro, it could have had its Headline replaced before, easy. Uh, a long time since I replaced one. Because you've mentioned that the owner used a whole bunch of glue everywhere. Maybe he didn't use the right glue. Maybe he used something that came from a hardware store. Don't have, don't believe everything from the hardware store works on your car. It uh, sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. Uh, always best to you know check that stuff out. Um, the, uh, I see we're getting close to the top of the hour, guys. Uh, before we get too far, I also want to mention one more time, right down below here, uh, there's uh, the 66 tips uh, brochure that uh, I put together. These are like tips from members all across the country. And, uh, you know, some of the things they've found to make restoration work in their garage easier. And uh, go ahead and, you know, it's, it's free. It's, it's uh, I, with 66 tips in there, I know you're going to find at least one or two that are going to make your life easier. And uh, go ahead, click on that, download that, make sure you, you get that. And, uh, and I think you'll enjoy that. There'll be a lot of things that we forget to in there. Well, yeah. <laughs> the older I get, the more I, the more I forget. The... Uh, Guys, I want to I want to thank you again, everybody, for coming out tonight. Uh, appreciate it, uh, Mark. We, uh, you know, go ahead and send me the picture. If you can't get through to that email address, go ahead and and send it to the member services and tell them to forward it to me. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll do a little research and ask around see if we can uh, uh, maybe find a good source for you. I know. I, 
dealing with some of this stuff when you're restoring cars, you know, in some cars you end up having to, you know, figure out another car where you can make something work from. Keep searching. Yep. And just keep, don't give up. Just keep looking. I'm sure you're going to find it. And uh, we're going to certainly give it our best shot too. Uh, with that, guys, thanks for coming out. Really appreciate it tonight. Thanks for a ton of great questions. Um, the uh, it, it's always it's always great to see what you guys are up to. I know we're going to be you know we're kind of reached that point where we finally got all of everything we got to get done. You know, the, finally got the last of my leaves out last weekend, so I'm finally going to spend some more time in the home shop here and get the. Uh, Start working again. Get the get some more projects uh, going on here. So uh, again, thanks for coming out. Thanks for the invite. And glad he showed up. <laughs> we'll see you again next time.